just wanted to go a little further in on the game planning stuff because I think, uh, you know, this is something that really intrigues me. And I think there's endless potential for ways to use speed on a football field. Um, and so what we've designed um, and what we've kind of come up with in, in terms of trying to understand how the game is played is we, we kind of call it, we jokingly call it the four lane offense. It's not, um, you know, it, it's just basically breaking up the field into quadrants and saying what takes place in each quadrant. Um, depending on where the ball is is placed on the field, um, and I think if you if you watch most football teams, a lot of what happens in a in a given game happens in quadrant two and three, um, and it's because the game is most uh, controllable, I guess you could say, in lane two and three. That's where that's where most of the scheme stuff happens um, up front on the offensive and defensive line. That's where the coach feels like they have the most control. When you get uh, potentially in lane one, but, but really in lane four, like if, if the ball was situated on the right hash and, and the field is to lane four and the boundaries to lane one, um, chaos is, is lane four is the chaos lane. It's the passing lane. Um, you know, we always pass on lane four on the highway. Um, and so really, I think um, there's a lot of potential for what we can do with lane four. And so what we've kind of, what we've kind of deemed is uh, – in the four lane offense, again, ball situated on the right hash. The first lane is, is the power lane. Like that's where we can really seek contact and put some of our most physical competitors um, into the boundary. Um, and and I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more. The really lane two and three, that, those are your daily drivers. Those are the rhythm, routine. Um, those are the athletes that you want to get uh, a lot of touches maybe. Maybe the, I think we all have, have coached a running back that – um, just takes a little bit time, of time to, to warm up and really needs maybe 15 or 20 carries to really get things going. Um, and so there's, there's space for that. But I think most of, um, most of American football is played in lane two and lane three. Um, and then four, I think, is the, is the speed lane and that, and that needs space. And I always like to go um, across different sports to, for analogies because I think it just makes sense to me. And so one of, the, one of the things I think about when I think about who do I want to put in the boundary as a receiver, a tight end, a running back, I want a kid that, that really does seek, seek out contact and uses their body um, it, during the, the course of the game. And, you know, probably one of the pe people that I think of most with absorbing contact and, and being able to seek contact and be explosive is a guy like Russell Westbrook. Um, when he's driving to the basket, he is seeking out contact, absorbing it, and maintaining the body control to finish at the rim. And a lot of times what you see in, in modern offenses is you'll see – a big receiver into the boundary who has the body control that you can throw a back shoulder fade to, and you can really win a one-on-one -on -one matchup where you're not asking him to create a lot of separation in space. Again, this is a kid from Clemson T Higgins, basically just is able to shield the defensive back with his body. And again, it's, it's body control athletes. Those are the ones you want into the boundary, the ones that can play physical, that can seek out contact that don't necessarily need a lot of room for them to be effective in, in what they're trying to get done, especially in the pass game. Um, and then you go, you go to lane, lane two and three, you want, you know, generally you want people that are reliable, available, ones that maybe need a little bit more rhythm and routine to get into the flow of things. And, you know, we all know those basketball players that can get to their spot on the floor. And as long as they get to their spot, like it's automatic, a guy like Dirk. Um, and there's players in football that, you know, they, they are one or two route receivers where like a guy like, for example, a guy like Doug Baldwin, who's going to run option routes underneath all day long. And you just, you just, keep feeding him throughout it he's tough he's reliable um explosive in his own way but not necessarily a vertical burner and this is again where you think about speed advantage stuff if you get Doug Baldwin on crossing routes where he's able to have options and and able to to really put people in a bind he's able to create separation horizontally um and that's that's a great person to have in the middle of the field maybe you're operating in your slot or maybe it's a tight end or maybe it's a running back body who um really operates well but then ultimately uh, you know, speed, I think, is where you can separate yourself. Um, and, and speed ultimately needs time and needs space. Um, and I think of, from the game of basketball, I think of shooters. You know, you want to get uh, a, a guy like Steph Curry, you want to get him space so he can let it go. And you don't really care how deep it sh he shoots it from. Him shooting a 40-footer is better than some people shooting a mid-range or, or even a layup. You want Steph Curry with the ball in his hands. And, and that's the equivalent of speed. Speed in the game of football, especially vertical threat speed, is the three-point shot in football because it, it just amplifies everything. It, it gives you um, – it, it, it's an unbelievable benefit to the point where in, in football, uh, basketball, you know, there's a huge movement away from even taking mid-range shots. Why would you even waste your time taking a mid-range shot? 
we're taking all three pointers, whether it's the Golden State Warriors, the Houston Rockets, all these teams that are moving from an analytics perspective and saying it's no longer worth it for us to take mid range jumpers. We're going to take completely all three pointers or layups. And so if you think about that from the game of football, maybe what that means is we're either pounding it into the boundary or getting speed to the field. We're not, we're not sticking around in mid range land. We're not staying in the middle two lanes. We're either trying to get the ball all the way to the field or we're trying to jam it into the boundary. Um, So again, I, I know that sports are different, but from a philosophical perspective, it's something to think about. And again, vertical route um, coming from lane four. This is John Ross, who's now on the Cincinnati Bengals. I think he's about to have a huge breakout year with um, with Joe Burrow under center if they they end up getting to play. But again, explosive vertical threat. He's just going to run right by here. People here, he's in the slot, puts his foot in the ground on the post and just runs by people. Again, when you're four two, um, you can do that. Um, And so, again, I think speed is speed really needs space and time to operate. And, and one, of the, one of the difficulties with football is you have to be able to protect in order to let speed actually get vertical uh, and be effective. And so I flipped, I flipped our chart over here. I put us on the right ha- or the left hash, powers into the boundary. We got rhythm and reliability in the middle of the field, and we got speed to the field. Now, in the game of football, it's challenging because getting the ball over here to the speed side, especially to, you know, and, and one of the things I'll, I'll quickly say this, Defensive football has evolved quite a bit. Um, and what it's done is what defensive football has tried to do is cap the, the top and say nothing behind us, which I think we've always kind of tried to do. But then what we're trying to do now from a defensive perspective is we're trying to spill everything. So you can see these defensive linemen. This is kind of a popular defense right now, the tight front, where we're, trying, we're really trying to get the ball to bounce outside. We're trying to let the Will and the Mike linebacker run to it. And then there's this midfield safety. I call him a third-level safety. And he's, he's kind of, he's uh, the Isaiah Simmons type where he's, we're just trying to free him up to run and make plays. So that, that particular player, that mid safety or that third level safety is really um, become a huge part of the game of football now um, to the point where uh, we need to find more creative ways to, to take advantage of, of speed because really what people are trying to do is they're trying to take you out of, um, take you out of the comfort level of, of your, your offense. So you know, you're not going to be able to hit a quick um, glance route on an RPO because that safety's sitting right there. Um, we're going to spill everything and make your inside zone stuff bounce and run to it. Um, that's, that's kind of the way defense is going. So one of the things that's really difficult for offenses nowadays is how do we get the ball to the field edge and really take advantage of our speed advantage there, especially with um, maybe your quarterback doesn't quite have a strong enough arm. And so one of the things that, uh, you know, I, I maybe uh, – I don't know. I, I, I just believe that the best play in the game of football is boot um, or some sort of play action. Um, and really what that requires is you have to establish some sort of run game or at least run threat and then play action or boot. Really what it does is it gives um, gives more time for plays to develop. And really what it what it does, in my opinion, is and again, this is where I'm always trying to think about um, how do I invert or flip the game? Um, from the way I think about the field even. So the rhythm and reliability is kind of always going to remain the same. Um, That middle of the field is is always going to be what the defense focuses on the most. Um, But how do we take advantage of the edges and how do we flip and, you know, maybe make power a speed zone and make speed and, you know, so with boot, here's how you do it. If you're running um, a boot play here, what you've done is with a crossing route, you've opened up a new, um, basically what you've done is you've transitioned it the power zone, which normally you'd maybe run the ball into the boundary or run some sort of, um, you know, back shoulder fade into the boundary or some sort of win route with a more physical receiver. What you can do is by flipping your personnel, don't necessarily think about where your personnel is pre-snap. Think about where your personnel is going to end up post-snap. And so with this type of a boot play um, off split zone action, the quarterback, first of all, the boot is going to allow time for these receivers to clear. So you've got a vertical route to to the field. And, and one of the things that is difficult for a lot of younger quarterbacks, especially at the high school level, is throwing the field side fade. So a lot of times you're going to get, especially if you're in any, uh, any type of trips alignment, you're going to get a corner meg, which is man everywhere he goes on the, the first receiver into the, uh, into the field. They're going to solo, or sorry, to the field. They're going to solo that guy up and play man to man. It's a huge uh, potential advantage for a defense. Um, and so if you're able to boot out, what you can do is you can, basically relocate your quarterback closer to the speed zone to the field 
make it a shorter throw and, and really open up that, that opportunity. But also, if you have a crossing route back to the boundary, you're essentially opening up a new speed alley because you've moved the pocket. So I think, uh, I think what offenses are trying to do more and more is, is and especially guys like Lincoln Riley and others um, like that who have had a lot of success with mobile quarterbacks, is they're trying to move the pocket and open up more speed zones instead of just staying in the middle of the field with rhythm and reliability. They're trying to open up the field for speed and open up the boundary for speed. You're seeing way more throwbacks in football now than you've ever seen before. And, you know, the, the old rule when I was playing, I was a high school quarterback in the wing tee, the old rule was you never throw across your body. And what that did is basically as soon as you, if I was a right-handed quarterback and I broke the pocket to my right, I was essentially shrinking the field as I ran. But what these newer offenses are doing is they're saying, we're, no, we're actually going to design plays for quarterbacks to throw across their body to open up speed zones that previously were never there. So defenses, if the quarterback broke the pocket, used to not have to worry about half the field. Now they still have to worry about the whole field. So again, it, you know, that's just a little uh, more specific scheme tidbit that I have for you. If you really are looking to, to open up the field and allow speed to run, first of all, it, uh, speed needs time and space. And so you have to be able to, to generate time and space. And boot is, I think, probably the best way to do it um, and open up more speed zones um, with, with different route combinations and even throwing back across your body as a quarterback. And, and you know, obviously, I think um, speed is, is essential to success in football. I think it's the most important thing. Um, and, and I think it's, it's a lot. It's one of those things where a lot of coaches say, you know, like Tony was saying, it's God given. You either have it or you don't. Um, and obviously we don't believe that. That's why we're here. We believe that you can at least help kids get faster. Not necessarily that you're going to make them, um, you know, four, four kids, but, but they can get faster. They can improve speed. It is, it is a skill that they can improve. Um, but I also believe the same thing about arm strength. And you're seeing a lot of research from uh, baseball pitchers, guys like Trevor Bauer, who are digging into the science of things and really giving that information now to quarterbacks who have been able to increase their arm strength. And the, the, there's a correlation or I guess a, a relationship between the speed of your receivers and the arm strength of your quarterback. And the, the stronger your quarterback's arm is and the faster your receivers are, the more of the field the defense has to defend. And so I guess what I'm saying more than anything is there are skills that we can develop through human performance. Skills like rotational force and arm strength, I think are, it's potential. we have a potential to, to get kids stronger arms. And we have a potential to get our skill position guys faster. And if we're doing both of those things, all of a sudden we have more offenses that look like the Kansas City Chiefs. Obviously, we don't have Patrick Mahomes. We don't have Tyree Kill but we're stretching the defense vertically because we have speed advantage. And all of a sudden we have some arm strength, at quarterback that can really make the game fun. Um, and so again, you know, football philosophy, it's all over the map. Everybody thinks differently about this, but I just think if you really take into account the way the global effects that speed can have on a defense um, and, and really design your game plan to take advantage of those, of the, the areas you do have the speed advantage, I think one, you're going to be successful. And I think, too, your kids are going to have so much fun playing because uh, there's nothing better than, than putting up points, playing fast, um, and, and playing free and not having to think a lot, but really just getting to run full speed. Um, so hopefully that, that was uh, helpful to some, someone. Hopefully you were able to pull something out of there. But, um, again, I love scheme, uh, but scheme is like the last thing we think about in our program. The, the foundational component of our program is human performance. And human performance for me is obviously speed development and and getting, getting stronger and, and getting more, more confident in those areas. But more than anything, human performance is about growing and maturing and getting better physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, in every way that you can as a human being, I want you to improve. Um, and so human performance, is, it, it's, it's above everything else. And I think that, that we need guys like Kurt and guys like Tony and, and Brad and some of you guys sitting here who have uh, a bigger perspective on the game than just wins and losses. Because the reality is, um, there is no way we should be losing human lives in the game of football. There's no way we should be caring more about winning a state championship than protecting a kid who has a concussion. Um, you know, we need to be thinking about the health and well-being of our athletes first and foremost. And I think once you establish that, you're going to have guys that are willing to, uh, to really buy in and go above and beyond um, for you and, and really make the program successful. So, Dan, I was going to ask you um... – uh, many of the coaches who have adopted the sprint-based football, the high-performance-first mantra, 
um, have also reported um, a difference in the way they feel as a coach as well. Yeah. Um, that, that when you start taking care of their performance, you start to take care of your own. Have you found that to be true? Oh, without a doubt. Um, we, we think that's the most important thing ever. The reality is if I'm asking my guys to show up on Friday night and be well rested, well hydrated and ready to roll, I better be the same. Um, and I better be my best self on game day. Um, and I want to be sharp mentally. I want to be sharp in, in every single way. And, you know, that's, that's been something huge for us as a, as a staff. One of the things that I've, I've actually gotten really inspired by um, the way rugby coaches um, interact with their teams on game day. Um, and, and really, I was watching a documentary on the All Blacks, and their, their coaches would go for a run in, during pregame. Um, and I've just started lifting on game day because clears my mind, gets some energy out of me. And, you know, my, the, the, you know, football coaches always say the hay's in the barn and then they stress like crazy 24 hours before the game. You know, if we've prepared our guys for game day, then we want to relax and enjoy that moment with them and watch them perform. And I always try and tell my guys when they take the field, I can't wait to see what you guys are going to do today. Um, and, and I think they have fun with it. And, and I certainly feel immensely better uh, because I'm not carrying all this stress throughout the week and, and trying to um, outwit and outthink everybody all the time. Um, because ultimately, players are the ones that win games. I, I, cannot, um, I cannot control the game nearly as much as, as, as football coaches think they can control the game. Um, what, I wanna, what, was the, what was the Steve Spurrier story you told me once? Yeah, so uh, I love this story from, from Spurrier back when he was at, at Florida. And he had some very intense guys coaching for him. Um, you know, I, I can't even remember all the list of, of, you know, really successful coaches that he had as assistants under him and they were hard chargers and he would kick them out of the office and make them go work out and make them go home to, to be with their families. And he was, you know, notorious for, um, you know, for working reasonable hours, I guess notorious is the only way you can describe it in the football <laughs> profession, because if you're working normal hours, you're, you're kind of a pariah and, you know, he would kick people out and say, you know, you need to be mentally rested and sharp for game day. Like you owe that to your players. Um, and, I, and I think that's something I, that really inspired me because there's, uh, there's so many schools of thought with football coaches of, of what's the best way to do it. And I think um, it's a football coaching is a shame based culture. We shame our players, we shame each other, we shame ourselves. Um, and I think we really need to switch that around and, and really try to reinvigorate joy and excitement and enthusiasm that comes kind of naturally from the game instead of, um, you know, gritting our teeth through everything. So, you know, you could tell, I think, um, those Spurrier teams played loose, played fast, um, seemed to really enjoy what they were doing. He's had a ton of success. And, um, you know, those are the kind of people I really want to pattern myself out after, people that um, are, are still human beings after. That's awesome. Love it.